from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, welcome everybody to the Coolidge Auditorium here at the library and to a conversation about disinformation and the threat to democracy. This, this uh, event is hosted by the Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. And uh, many of you may not know much about the Kluge Center, so I'm going to give you a one-sentence synopsis. Uh, it's, it was created to reinvigorate, in the words of its charter, to reinvigorate the interconnection between thought and action at a high level. Conversations like these addressing challenges facing democracies in the 21st century are a key part of that effort. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our guest today, Anne Applebaum, who, as many of you know, is a columnist for the Washington Post and a prize-winning historian. She, her degrees are from, at the bachelor's level, Yale. She has a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics, and Georgetown granted her an honorary doctorate. She's a professor of practice at the London School of Economics, where she runs ARENA, a research project on disinformation, and she's the author of Gulag, a history in 2004, which won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. She won the Kundal History Prize in 2013 for Iron Curtain, the crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956. And just this year, she won the Lionel Gerber Prize uh, for Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. We'll have a book signing afterward next door in, in the Woodall Pavilion for Red Famine. And I wanted to start out to give you an opportunity to tell us what that book's about and uh, why it would be rev relevant to us. Uh, well, first of all, before that, I should say thank you. I'm really delighted to be at the Library of Congress. Um, it's uh, a place where I've done research myself. Um, from my first book on the Gulag, you have, a, you have a pretty extensive collection of dissident material that I, that I was able to use. Russian dissident, I should say, not American dissident, although you probably have that too. I think somewhere. so. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere, um, American samizdat. Um, so, so, so thank you for, for inviting me here. Um, Red Famine is a history of the Ukrainian famine. Um, it's, uh, and it's also an argument about the Ukrainian famine and why it happened. And this was a, um, uh, a famine that took place in the years 1932-33. Uh, and the, the book argues that it was, it, well, we, we, we've known for a long time that it was not an accidental famine. So it was not caused by the weather, it was not caused by um, bad crops, it was not caused by insects, it was caused by a deliberate set of decisions taken by Stalin um, designed to weaken the Ukrainian peasantry and it resulted, it was, and it was literally caused by confiscation of food. So when you confiscate people's food, when you take their food away and then as the Soviet Union did, you block roads so that peasants can't get to the cities and people couldn't leave the Ukrainian public, then you have um, a lot of people die. So the, the book is an argument about why that happened, why Stalin did that, why Ukraine. Um, it's a little bit of a potted history of Ukraine. It explains what Ukrainian nationalism was, what the Ukrainian national movement was, why Stalin disliked it. Um, and I suppose it leads into our, uh, into our current subject now in ways too, because one of the reasons why it was possible um, one of the reasons why it was possible to persuade people to confiscate the food of starving people and, to, and because, of course, this required a massive operation was that it followed a decade-long um, campaign against both the so-called kulaks, the kulak witch peasants, and also against um, Ukraine and Ukrainians. Um, and the, the, one of the things you learn when you study Stalinism, I've now written three books about, essentially about Stalin and, and his way of thinking and his way of t occupying countries, is that none of the violence that is possible would have been possible without the propaganda that prepared the violence. And so you immediately begin to think about how it is that you change people's minds, how you prepare them to do terrible things, um, how, you, um, how you convince them to accept certain, uh, you know, a Stalinist or totalitarian structure of the country. Um, and that gets you thinking um, a lot about political language and how it's used and who's using it. And um, that's, in my head, one of the parallels between studying the history of the past and then trying to understand the politics of the present. Mm -hmm. So uh, you grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, became an expert on the Soviet Union and Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, how did that happen? How did you get interested in that? And how Bad did you... luck. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, there's there are different ways to answer that. And so I was I was at university in the 1980s, um, early 80s, when it was kind of the height of what we called the new Cold War. As Reagan was president, and the Soviet Union seemed like this urgent problem that had to be solved. And so, like lots of people, I studied Russian. Um, I had another idea, which is that I was I had been a fairly pretentious teenager, and my favorite writer was uh, Nabokov, and I had this idea that I would be able to read him in Russian. Um, and one of the horrible ironies is that although I do speak Russian, I read it and use it all the time, and I can read Tolstoy. Um, he's a pretty, he's a very clear writer. I have a lot of trouble reading Nabokov. So that was all, <laughs> he's a very, he, he writes in a very- You have something well, to aspire to then. I, I can still aspire to that, but so, um, so that, was, that was another side reason. But no, I was drawn to it, um, I, I studied it. I was lucky enough to be a student in Leningrad in 1984. I was a, a, spent a summer there when it was still Leningrad. And so I saw the, the end of the Soviet Union when it was still the Soviet Union. Um, and I realized only years later, I've written about this recently, that that was a stroke of luck because a couple of years later, if you went to Leningrad, um, you would have been there during Perestroika and it would have all looked different. So I was almost the last generation of American students who saw it when it was still the USSR and it was still a totalitarian state or aspired to be a totalitarian and state. And you ended up in, in uh, or you, you were in Poland. Right, and, and then the, the Berlin second. Berlin Wall right. fell, and so you'd, you'd been. Right, you know, so then the second, the, second, the second piece of luck, good luck, bad luck, is that I was in. Um, the, the interest in the region led me to become a freelance writer. I was a, a stringer in Poland in 1988 to 89, and I was there when communism fell and when the Berlin Wall fell. And you know, after that, I was, you know, I was stuck with that region. So. <laughs> I also married a Pole, so that's a, there we go. <laughs> uh, that, that was another reason to stay there. And I've I've actually been living in in Central Europe on on and off since you know for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So at LSC, you have this uh, research project, Arena. Tell us a little bit more about that. What are you doing with that? So Arena evolved out of um, with I, I run it with a colleague um, called Peter Pomerantsev, who's a, a British television producer and journalist who'd worked for ten years in Russia and wrote a very brilliant book about um, the Russian, the creation of the Putinist propaganda state, and it has a wonderful title. Um, the title is "Nothing Is True and Everything Is Possible." Um, so if you if you if you want if you want background on on how um, on, on the change in Russia, it's a very good book to read. Um, he and I both, at the same time, and for slightly different reasons, got interested in um, the, uh, the, the, the question of how uh, Russian attempts to use the, the qualities of the internet and the qualities of social media in order to um, promote uh, both true and false, but um, pro-Russian narratives um, was beginning to take off um, I, I was interested in it from my perch in Central Europe. I was watching Russian political influence campaigns, the attempt to influence elections. Um, this, of course, all burst into the open in 2014 when Russia invaded Ukraine. And then I think that was the, the moment when many people you know, saw more clearly what they were doing. Because, of course, the invasion of Crimea, if you can remember that, was accompanied by a um, a massive denial. You know, we don't know who these masked men are who are walking through Crimea. We have no idea where they got their weapons. I think the president of Russia even said, "Oh, maybe they bought them in a shop. You know, you can buy, you know, armed personnel carriers. You know, in the safe way and um, <laughs> in Yalta." And and but it was actually a very effective campaign because it confused people for a long, for certainly for long enough for them to occupy Crimea. Um, and then it was followed by a similar campaign attempting to divide Ukraine. And I think this was the moment when people were oriented. To, you know, we saw it a little bit earlier than that. So we, we began by int being interested in this problem and trying to define how um, the authoritarian states in the modern world use language, how they're using the internet. Uh, I think we've, we, one of the things that happens when you study um, you know, sort of Russian disinformation campaigns online is pretty quickly you begin to understand that the problem isn't really Russia. Um, Rush, the Russians state for historical reasons because they've been doing this for many years is what the KGB famously did. I mean, this is in all my books. Um, was interested in how to use language to manipulate people and was interested also in trying to penetrate. I mean, we can remember, you know, Ru Soviet support for the communist parties all over the West and was interested in trying to get political influence in the West. This is very old, you know, um, but pretty, you know, they were they were good at this because they've been thinking about it longer because they saw the possibilities first. 
but really anything that they do now, almost anybody else could do. I mean, there's no, you know, the, the creation of a bot farm or a trolling campaign, we can talk about what that is in a, in a second if you want, um, is something anyone can do. You can do it in Russia, you can do it in China, you can do it in Texas. I mean, it's not a, it doesn't require any special technological knowledge, a little bit maybe, but not that much investment. And so it's really that you get really quickly to understanding that this is to do with the nature of um, how we get and receive information now more generally. And so the, our, our projects, it does two things. We study, we have done some projects very specifically on Russia and looking at Russian attempts to do political influence in, we did one in Germany, um, but also looking at you know, how might we rethink what media does in order to reach alienated audiences? Are there ways to, um, to, 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 to counter the spread of falsehood online. And so we've done these experiments, which is, we've only actually been in existence for a year and a half, because mm -hmm. we, um, we were both working on the subject and writing about it, and then we decided it, it deserved its little seat at the university, and we, were, we made a arrangement with LSE. So, okay. so uh, to the, specifically to the topic of the, of the conversation here today, how do you describe the threat from disinformation broadly, and and does it constitute a paradigm shift? So I think the um, I think that the 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 way again the way in which we get and receive and and issue political information has changed very fundamentally, and I think I would say that it is a paradigm shift. And a good comparison um, is the. The invention of the printing press, um, uh, you know, it seems like a long time ago, but if you think of what happened when, um, uh, you know, instead of language being controlled by, you know, monks in monasteries who copied out manuscripts and handed them out to specific people, you know, who then passed them on more broadly, you know, th there, was a, there was a very severe system of gatekeeping in terms of who controlled information. Um, up until the up until the the, the 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 printing press was invented, and then once you had the printing press, you had this multiple. You had exactly the same effect you had now, which is suddenly all kinds of people can read and get access to information. They can question what the monks are doing, um, and this has both positive and negative effects. Um, it means that suddenly, I mean, it, it's it's what led to the Reformation. It's what led to the Protestantism and. Actually, I've, I've talked about this recently in Austria, and I could say, well, I didn't, I, people in this room might not like Protestantism, but uh, maybe people in the United States think it's okay. So anyway, there's <laughs> different views about that. But, but you know, and, and they're positive and negative, um, but one of the things that it did do is it then created enormous political conflicts, and there was a, you know, there were religious wars in Europe, um, you know, well into the next century. Um, and you know, it, it, it created real political division and change, and again, in both a positive and negative sense. And I think that's what we're seeing social media doing, is that it's given suddenly, really all of us are writers, and all of us are journalists, and all of us are publishers. You know, anybody who writes something on Facebook or Twitter and then passes it on is now functionally publishing. Um, and that means that the, um, you know, the, the, the way in which people see things, what they, what they trust and don't trust, um, what they, um, the, you know, the, the, you know the, the way they look at news has changed very fundamentally. And really, every time this has happened in recent history, it's been accompanied by major political changes. I mean, you don't, you know, you had religious wars um, in the 16th and 17th century, but actually, after the invention of radio, um, who were the first real beneficiaries of radio? Who understood its power better than anybody else? And the answer is Hitler and Stalin, who were both obsessed with the radio. They both used it. Um, when, I mean, just as an example, when Stalin um, arrived in, uh, when he invaded, uh, when he arrived in Berlin in May 1945, the absolute first thing he did before he did anything else was take over the radio station. I mean, even really before they'd finished fighting in other parts of the city. And we had somebody who didn't like the Reformation, Father Coughlin also was, he was a yes. radio guy. Yes, no, no, I mean, understanding how to use radio um, was, but then of course, what was the reaction? Well, one of those, Franklin Roosevelt also learned how to use the yep. radio. Um, the BBC in Britain is a very interesting reaction to the radio because the British state suddenly said, right, how do we channel this in a positive way? How do we bring people who live in the Shetland Islands and in Cornwall into a national conversation? And they just, you know, the BBC was partly a creation of this fear that, um, you know, of, of, a, of, a, of a social breakdown that would be created if we don't think 
if we don't find ways to use it positively. And you know, different countries have came up with different answers to the disorganization of radio. But that's, a, that's all a segue. I don't want to get too much into the history of saying that I think we're living through exactly that same kind of moment. Um, uh, and, and, and it has, um, again, both very positive and very negative effects. I mean, technology, the technology itself is neutral. I mean, I'm not anti-internet or anti-social media, um, but neither am I a utopian who thinks that, you know, now that we have social media, we're all connected, mm -hmm. everything will be better, because clearly that's not the case. I mean, one of the effects, for example, um, is that we now have effectively a global media space. So. Whereas in the past, in the Soviet era, if um, you know, the KGB wanted to try and create a rumor, for example, um, there's a wonderful example in the 1980s, the KGB staged this huge operation designed to create and push the rumor that the CIA had created AIDS. It was the famous right. story. And they tried to plant it in different presses and they found sympathetic journalists who would write about it and, and they, you know, they had different things. But this was a very difficult to spread this rumor. I mean, they, they did it actually. They succeeded in convincing some people in Malaysia or wherever. But, um, you know, but it was a tedious process and it took many months. So now you want to create a rumor, you know, you, what you, you know, you just, you, you um, create, you know, 10 fake websites that support it. You, you know, have them echo one another, you create, um, you know, a, a bot farm or a troll farm that can push it out, um, and it's you can do it in an hour. Because there's been rumors about Zika that that would that could be analogous to the one about. Right. I mean, there are lots of it. I mean, <clears throat> now that now the you know the the amount of rumor and falsehood that we see you know every day is 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 extraordinary. I mean, this is not to say that there were no problems with the previous media model, and I'm not here to add, even though I work for the Washington Post, I don't I don't advocate returning to it. I don't think we're going to put it back together again. I don't have any nostalgia for. Walter Cronkite or whatever, you know, but, but, you know, nevertheless, we live in this new world and it's important to understand, you know, the positive and negative. So, so are, do the, do the ma major media sources, some people call them mainstream media, but the major media sources, uh, they're, they're, I don't know whether it's, I want to put intention into this, but are they, me aren't they meant to be a bulwark against this? Why aren't, why aren't they serving as a bulwark against, you know, fake news or are they? Well, they, they try. Um, you know, there are lots of people have experimented with doing fact checking, creating fact checking websites, or having right. special fact checkers <laughs> on the pages. Um, you know, but it, it, that and that works up to a point. It works with those audiences who trust the fact checkers and who trust, I don't know, the Washington Post. But it does not work with audiences who don't trust the Washington Post, of which there are, you know, very large numbers. And so. Um, the problem can't really be solved by um, by institutions that don't, you know, that, other, that lots of people don't read uh, or don't see or don't or don't believe actually. So, so um, I don't think it's a problem that the mainstream media, so-called mainstream media, can solve by itself. And so, uh, is it? Are we at a point then where uh, I don't know? Objectivity is a, is a loaded term in some ways, but where the concept of ob objectivity or at least even-handedness. Uh, you know, doesn't hold any sway? Is it, is it at that level, do you think? Um, you, you know, you, I think that it's a little bit different than that. I mean, the, the problem is that there's no public agreement on what objectivity and even-handedness means. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are certainly still people working in journalism who believe very much that they can do that. I mean, I have colleagues who, I'm myself a columnist, and so this isn't my problem as much as it is others. Um, but yes, certainly there are people who believe absolutely that you know their function in life is not to promote or a, a political you know narrative or a or a political candidate, but what they're supposed to do is to, you know tell you what happened yesterday, um, and that's very much um, for a, for a large piece of the press that motivates a lot of people to go into journalism. You know, people who want to look for the truth and and try and bring honesty into public life. And if you ask people what their motives are, that's often it. Um, so I don't think it's dead as an ideal, but um, I think you would find, certainly in this country, but also you know, across Europe, you, know, you would find differing, um, differing views about whether that's possible. I actually had a conversation, um, it was, to me it was quite a shocking conversation, but it was to, with a Hungarian um, sort of former colleague a, a few weeks ago who just said to me point blank, oh, you're, you with your, you know, you Americans who believe in this nonsense about objective journalism, you know, we all know that it's all one side or the other and, you know, it's, you know, stop pretending. Which is interesting because the, 
you know, the attack on the possibility of good journalism, the attack on for the independence of the judiciary, the attack on the you know, neutrality of civil servants, um, all these kinds of attacks are we have heard before, and this is exactly, I mean, when you look at the history of Soviet communism, the one of the, you know, if you would hear Lenin talk a lot about bourgeois, so-called bourgeois democracy and its fake institutions and its pretend media, which is really in the service of somebody or another, and it's really all a reflection of the power structure. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and on the right, you would have, um, uh, you know, this is very much how fascists spoke as well. You know, we don't believe in these fake institutions. So these these kinds of this dislike of um, of any possibility of neutrality or honesty in public life is is not new, and it is it, it certainly has. You know, I do not believe that we are now living through the 1930s by any means. But um, but you know, you can certainly see the possibility, the negative possibilities that could come from this. So um, I want to move on to some of the a few of the mechanics of disinformation before we get there. I just want to, uh, uh, is, it, is it possible that, that, it, that we're overreacting, that the discourse really isn't as poisoned as what you're, you might be suggesting? I mean, you know, it's always possible that we're overreacting, um, but it's, um, you know, maybe better to see and acknowledge the problems and try and deal with them rather than to ignore them and pretend they don't exist. I mean, I actually had with this, just with the narrow point of Russian disinformation, I had for a long time people saying to me, oh, this is, maybe this is a problem for some people in Poland or Ukraine, but this isn't a real problem. It doesn't really exist anywhere else. And it was a kind of, even in this city, when you talk to people in Congress about it, and you got a kind of, well, this is a sort of third-rate issue, and we're sort of interested in it, but not really. Um, I did find, um, after the last US election, um, a major change <laughs> in how people see it, and suddenly people understood, OK, this is what, this is what the Russians do. They, they create fake book, Facebook pages designed that we've all, we, most people will have seen the um, the description of how that works, and they create um, in their, uh, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter Facebook pages on the one hand, and anti-immigrant ones on the other, and they try and stage and create conflict. And now that people have seen, oh yeah, that's how it worked here, there's, there's more interest in understanding how it works around the world. But you, it's almost as if people here had to experience it or see it for themselves before they yeah. believed that it was a real problem. So, so the, but the Soviet Union always propagandized. Sure. Is, is this different in some way? So it's, 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 it's only different in that the ease and speed with which it can be done is different. Mm -hmm. um, it's different in that the kinds of language they're using and what they're working with is different. So when you look at, I mean, this is really not about disinformation, but more about Russian political influence campaigns. For example, in Europe, um, there, you know, in the olden days, the Soviet Union looked for communists and fellow travelers that it could work with in, in different countries. And actually, the modern Russian state is, in a, in a certain sense, much less ideological. So they're not, you know, they're not bound to any particular ideology. What they're looking for is anybody on the far right, anybody on the far left, but even, you know, you can they look for others as well who who serve their broader strategy in Europe, which is kind of anti-European, anti-European Union, anti-NATO, anti-American. I mean, they seek to undermine Western institutions. And you know, the, what they do, they don't actually create, um, they don't, you know, they didn't create Marine Le Pen, for example, who's the far right leader of the National Front in France. She's an old, she's been in politics for decades, so is her father. Um, they didn't create her or invent her, but they sought to amplify her message. And that's just something that's easier to do than it used to be. And you can do it with, um, uh, you can do it by, you know, you can do it with money. They funded her political campaign, or you can do it online with, um, uh, you know, with fake, you know, internet users and fake social media campaigns. Um, it, it's, so it's simply working with existing cleavages in Western societies. They can, they can do quite a lot. So it's not... No, I don't think it's fundamentally different, but the, the, the ground is fertile and the, 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 it's much easier and much cheaper than it ever was. And they're not promoting themselves. I mean, they're not promoting communism. No, they don't really so care if we <clears throat> like them or admire them at all, actually. I mean, they don't, they, like, for example, it's very different from the Chinese who do care. You know, whether so so are, they, are they doing any self-promotion internally? I mean, if, if they... No, so that's different. I mean, Russian um, propaganda campaigns inside Russia are much, are, you know, really are much, much more important. And th those are also, by the way, very, the language that's used in the Russian media, there was recently a very good study done of the three main Russian television channels. 
um, looking at what they, um, you know, what they, what they, the stories that they wrote and publicized about Europe. And this was, and this was, and by the way, the United States, it's a very similar story. And I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head the, the, the numbers, I just wrote about this a couple of days ago. Um, but it's something like 17 times a day, um, you know, cer certainly multiple times a day, you get negative stories on Russian television of all kinds. And they fit into particular narratives. You know, Europe is weak, Europe is disorganized. Also, Europeans are, you know, terrified by terrorism and they, they live at home in fear. Um, the European, um, you know, there's, a, there's a re repeated stories, for example, you know, if you live in Europe, your children can be taken away and given to gay families because there's this terror, you know, terror, kind of, ter they terrorize you with homosexuality. I mean, I, I know it sounds absurd, but that is actually stories that you get on, on Russian television. So it's, and, and it's, and at the same time, Europe is very aggressive and Russophobic and they're anti us. So it tries to show both, I mean, the, the purpose of that is to, is to make sure that no Russians think that democracy or European values are better, that they don't find it attractive, so that they don't try to revolt against um, the, the authoritarian and oligarchic system that they have. Um, and also maybe to prepare, you know, get people prepared for some kind of conflict. So uh, onto the mechanics, uh, what exactly are bots? And uh, for those of us who are less uh, technologically savvy, and, and, and what other specific methods are being used to uh, what hack or troll or? Uh, so somebody, um, uh, somebody recently, uh, this is not my original, I didn't make up this breakdown, but um, so, um, one of the ways to think about, you know, fakeness, or I, hate, I really hate the expression fake news for all the obvious reasons, but um, one of the ways to think about falsity or falsehood on the internet um, is to think about it in different categories. And so first of all, there's the category of fake identities. Um, there are, you know, people who are pretending to be someone else. Um, there are bots, which are little pieces, of, for those who, who don't do these things, these are little pieces of computer code that imitate human social media behavior so they can be automated. Um, you can create bot farms so that you can create, I don't know, 10,000 bots which will retweet certain or re post certain kinds of messages, and some of these are pretty crude and you can actually detect them with, you know, pretty easily. And some of them are quite sophisticated. You know, they'll respond to a particular word or to a particular idea and they'll, they'll immediately create a response. Um, and so you can, you can essentially automate reactions. So you have fake people, fake websites, you know, which are pretend to be one thing but are really something else. And that's, by the way, very easy to do. I mean, you know, lots of you know, anybody in this room could have a fake Facebook page or a fake um, Twitter page, it's a Twitter account, so not, it's not difficult. Um, you might have to have some technological capability to create a bot, but even I, apparently not even that, not even so hard, so <laughs> maybe so, for you and me, but. So, so you're. But, no, so anyway, there's this level of fake identity, mm -hmm. and that's one thing, and then there's a second level, which is fake <coughs> audiences, so you can create fake people, and then you can, give the impression that you have more followers than you do, or you can, um, you can, or you can you know, seek to show that something is more popular than it is. You can seek to make something more popular, as I say, using automation or using um, trolls, which are people who are professionally posting things on the internet. And this is something the Russians did before anybody else. They understood the, the possibilities of that. And they created these famous troll farms um, in St. Petersburg, which is actually a wonderful image if you think about little trolls, you know, in a farm, but it's There's no famine there right now, apparently. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the, Anyways, uh, you know, so these, and these are different, like, you know, then you have a third level, which is actual fake stories, you know, invented stories, um, which can be then promoted by these, you know, by the, by the fake people and the fake um, amplifiers. Um, and then there's a fourth level, which is sort of entirely fake narratives. So, for example, this narrative that I just mentioned in Russia about the, the terrorism, you know, that the government is terrorizing people who are insufficiently um, uh, pro-gay. I mean, this is, you know, sorry to use that, but that's, the, that's, that's part of the narrative. So, and you know, and that's repeated again and again, and it's shown in different kinds of stories, and there are different ways in which it's, um, you know, there's a version of this that's used quite a lot in Western Europe, which is to do with um, immigrants. You know, immigrants are coming, they're gonna rape your daughters. Um, you know, you know, pictures and photographs are shown in different ways. I mean, during the German election, this was a big, um, this was a big Russian theme. Was was it was an attempt to, 
scare people and worry people and make them. So it's an attempt to create fear and so on. Anyway, these are all these are sort of different levels of of ways in which falsehood exists on the internet. And you know, it may be that through controlling even the problem of fake identities, you could do quite a lot to eliminate the problem of fake. You know, we, we, we need to begin breaking down this problem, and if we want to really think about stopping it, st start. One, one wants to start with the narrative problem, so how do we fight back against Russia, but maybe actually we should go back further down and look at how, um, how anonymity works on the internet, ask whether we want there to be that much anonymity, and, and so on. So uh, it, it, do you know of any specific examples at any of those levels, but say, for example, at the uh, creating a fake audience level, that's, that, that Russia might be doing now in the US? So actually, I haven't, I mean, I, I mean, we know what they were doing during the US election. I mean, right. that was the, um, that's now been published. Um, so for example, um, they created fake, um, I mean, well, this is one I, I was shown actually. So they created, for example, a fake Black Lives Matter Twitter account um, that looked like a real one and sought to obtain audiences. Um, and you know, what is the purpose of doing that? Well, the purpose was that it's at some point to use the trust that people had in that account in order to get past a message to that audience. So they seek to create false audiences. For, and again, sometimes using real causes. I mean, of course, there's a real Black Lives Matter. It doesn't mean that it's not real. But in addition to that, they seek to create copycat or imitation ones that they can get followers or get audiences and then use that, the trust that they gain to pass messages. Because one of the important things now, if you ask what's different about now in the past, is um, we have much more divided audiences than we once did. Um, and people now are much more likely to get their information, they get it from people they trust, um, and they get it from whatever, their friends on Facebook or their cousins who they follow. And, um, and so the, the, you know, the game is to build audiences that trust you. Um, since, since the, as, you, you know, as we've said, the, the markers of quality or the markers of trust that used to exist are gone. I mean, even somebody was saying to me the other day, if you think about how even when you used to read, for example, a mainstream newspaper, you know, you had the front page, you know, and then you had the sports section, and then you had the, you know, the comics, you know, and then you had the opinion pages. And even you would see those visually, and you would think of them all a little bit different. Like you didn't think the comic page was news, right? I mean, right. presumably. <laughs> um, and when you looked at the opinion page, the way it was structured, I mean, for example, that's before Doonesbury. That's what you're talking about. Pre before Doonesbury, yeah. that's right. But if you looked at the um, at the op-ed page, you knew these were op-eds, right? Okay, there's the editorials on the left, and then the opinions on the right, and this is different from the news. And so here you're reading people's opinions and interpretations, and the news is meant to be this. Okay, this is all completely broken down. You know, when you look at the, you look at something that says Washington Post on the top, you don't have any sense immediately of whether that's an op-ed or it's a news story or it's a joke or it's a parody or, um, and so. And so, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the hierarchies have broken down, and so people, um, you know, when people decide um, what they're going to trust, they, you know, they often rely on their friends, or they rely on, you know, certain kinds of, you know, language that they trust, or certain kinds of people, or, or, or and so on. And this is what the Russians tried to use. And again, I'm, we're talking about the Russians, but really anybody could do it. Um, in order to build particular audiences that they could then message. Is, is China in this space then? So yes and no, um, they have a they have a different set of tactics. They I don't think the Chinese are interested in, tr um, in for the most part. It's certainly in European and American politics, they're not seeking to, you know, undermine democracy or increase extremism or elect particular candidates. They don't have that interest, and they don't seem to be playing that at all. In fact, I mean, the Chinese are not interested in extremism at all. They like the world to be very stable. They're actually very happy with NATO. They don't want it to fall apart. They don't want the EU to fall apart. They like dealing with, um, you know, they have their, they, you know, the status quo suits them in that way. Russia is a revisionist power that doesn't like the way the international system is and wants to undermine it. So they have a different. So the Chinese are doing different things, though. They are, um, they do seek to not so much online, but they seek to use institutions like Confucius centers that they fund. And they seek to get influence in American universities. Um, they have, you know, through scholars. Um, there are some, in some European countries, I mean, oddly, you know, in some Central European countries, they, 
they've made kind of targeted investments that they seek to then use to get some, but when they have political influence, what they're interested in is, for example, discouraging country X or Y from having a relationship with the Dalai Lama. I mean, they have particular political goals that they care about um, that are more to do with them. So right. it's more, and it's, they don't have this, you know, this Russian style interest in kind of upsetting the apple cart. So, so as a as a practical policy matter, <clears throat> uh, is the I think they're different. Yeah, but but uh, is the U.S. government tracking uh, disinformation so this is an efforts in our question. elections so, yet? No, I mean, it, there are pieces of the U.S. government. I mean, actually, a lot of pieces of the U.S. government understand this issue quite well. Um, certainly, people you know in the so, you know, in the, at the Pentagon and at the State Department, they understand, particularly this Russian problem, they, you know, for, you know, if you're worried about, for example, American troops that are based in the Baltic states, you know, you, you think about this problem every day, um, you know, because it, 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 it happens, you know, um, you're worried about, you know, people trying to hack your soldiers, and at the same time, you're worried about, I don't know, a fake story saying that an American soldier is, has raped a Lithuanian girl and what are you gonna do about that? So people are thinking about it all the time. It's a very, very big and important problem. Um, uh, what, what we don't have yet is a center in the government or a place where you could um, f track and monitor these things in a, in a daily way and in a comprehensive way. It, let's put it, let me put it differently. It isn't anybody's full-time job to worry about this. Is, is, I mean, so, you know, there, there, there are pockets of people who are interested in it and care about it, but I don't know that there's a center. I mean, in terms of our elections, there is, I know that the state, um, kind of state level, I mean, this is more to do with the me mechanics of elections. Um, state level, you know, election offices, election commissions are worried about it and do think about it and talk about it. There was recently an interesting kind of training exercises at Harvard um, that was partly funded by the media tech companies, um, which train, they did a kind of war game. So imagine it's election day and, um, and you know, here, 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 uh, you know, here are some attacks on the system that are coming. Someone's trying to hack your system. What do you, how do you react? And so it was a kind of training that they run like a war game where they had, I think, people from all 50 states uh, it, participating. Are you aware of, of the status of what academic research is on this? I mean, I know you're doing some of this at LSC, but... So there is academic research. Um, it's, again, it's still pretty scattered. This is a very new subject and issue, um, but there are some very good people, both in this country and, and elsewhere, who have begun trying to analyze social media. Um, one of the problems is that the... Um, some is... So Twitter is quite easy to analyze. Facebook is very difficult. Difficult. Facebook has not made its data accessible to academics. I think they're under... After the political pressure of the last couple of months, they're talking about it in, in, in very controlled ways, you know, in ways that are... So that your people or the academics, researchers, are blind to individuals and details and so on, making data available so that people can understand how some of this works. But... Um, but the, you know, it's a, look, it's a new field. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, so ripe, in other words. So, um, uh, I mean, who could or should be fighting back against it then? I mean, the government's not involved in it, except it's at the, the Intel level, perhaps. Uh, you know, sh it, should it be, uh, you know, should tech companies be relied upon? I mean, how, how are we... What would make sense as a strategy, as a society, to So to, it's to a fight difficult question. I've been, I've been thinking about this for a while now. There's a, what you can't, I, I think it's impossible to look for a sort of silver bullet strategy. You know, there's gonna be one answer, and if we can just find this, then we're gonna fix it. Um, I think there's gonna be a range of answers. I mean, I think some of the answers could be found by the tech companies if they wanted to find it, and if they don't wanna find it, we might have to make them find it. And mm -hmm. this, again, this is this problem of fake identities, and fake amplification. I mean, this is something that could be fixed technically or technologically. So that's a, there's that piece of it. Um, there is, um, there is a, you know, there's clearly a role for media and for journalists to think differently. How do we reach the people who don't read us? I mean, this is an interesting problem. Um, there is a role for civic organizations, for, um, uh, for people who, uh, you know, who, who do online investigations of this and who, who do fact checking and, and the, the, the funding for that and activity in that space has bumped up a lot in the last, even in the last year, there's foundations are now interested in that kind of problem. And I think there's a, there's a, there's obviously there's a role for education at, at many levels, not just kind of in schools, but 
um, you know, adults should learn how to, you know, how to, you know, this question of detecting what's true and what's false on the internet. We were just talking before about how students don't necessarily see anymore what's a good source and what's a bad source online. I mean, I think there's the same for adults, you know, almost everybody. We yeah, because you and I were, when we were in college, we were, you go to the card catalog and, and everything, virtually everything was a, was a major publisher right. or a university press. And so, so it, it was relatively reputable and then you follow sites and, and bibliographies. But right. today it's, you know, and we had actually to get out of our dorm room to go there and do that right. <laughs> as opposed to being bombarded with all this stuff. And uh, so, so that's, I mean, you know, we're the suckers ultimately, right? So the, and, and so uh, it, it's our weakness, and that's what you, is, is that yeah. what we have to address? That's, you know, one of the issues that I haven't resolved in my head, actually, um, is the question of do people want to know what's true? Do they want good information? Um, and we all think we want it, and if you ask people, they say they want it, but how much effort are people willing to put in in order to get it? Mm -hmm. um, and this then becomes a political problem, because if they aren't willing to do it, um, I don't know, can you have democracy if people don't care anymore whether things are true or false? It's a, it begins to be, um, it begins to become a, re, a, you know, a real challenge. Um, and the second problem then is, can you have democracy if you don't have, so one of the effects of social media and, and you know, online media um, is that, as I said, people are, people are now siloed in their echo chambers where different people trust different kinds of news. Okay, but if you don't, if there's no shared public space, if we're not all having the same debate anymore, if we don't, and this isn't about opinion, no, like left wing, right wing, this is like, do we all agree what happened yesterday, right? If we don't all agree what happened yesterday, how do we make a policy to deal with it, or how do we debate it or talk about it? Um, and finding ways to bring back some kind of shared public space, and it's a, I think that's a real crisis, and particularly in this country. I mean, in some European countries where you still have public broadcasters, there's, you know, there still is the BBC, you know, even mm -hmm. if not everybody likes it, it exists and it's a, everyone agrees that it's a legitimate news organ, but I mean, look in this country, we have people who, who you know, who, I don't think there is a national agreement about who's legitimate television and who's not. So uh, <clears throat> one of Russia's targets, of course, is Ukraine and you've written a good bit about it. Uh, are they trying to do anything? So Ukraine do is fascinating actually, because Ukraine is a kind of Petri dish. Um, Ukraine is where, all kinds of, you know, where Russian political influence campaigns have been tried in practice. Almost, almost everything you see everywhere else has been tried at least once in Ukraine, including, you know, whatever, hacking people's private email or creating, you know, bot nets that will, you know, that was all done, you know, over the last decade in Ukraine. I think it's a, and it's also been a kind of Petri dish for responses. Um, the first really good and interesting, um, uh, kind of anti-disinformation NGO or a civil society group uh, was created in Ukraine called Stop Fake. Um, and Stop Fake began using um, uh, sort of techniques of online journalism to identify when a picture was fake or when a video was fake or when, you know, and they, and they, they create, again, they created, they, they, you know, they sought to reach journalists and they began looking at identifying. This is not so much fact checking as verification uh, so they're in, they're, it's an interesting group, and they've tried, you know, they've tried different experiments and trying to figure out how to reach people, how to try in different languages, and so on. Um, the, you know, the Ukrainian government has also tried some things that I think are negative. You know, they've tried to ban. Um, they have banned actually. There's a there's a Russian um, social media uh, platform called VK, um, which is now banned in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and they just, you know, they they reckon that's manipulated and so they ban. So they, they try and do it by banning things and we'll see whether that works. I think, you know, probably won't. Um, you know, one of the answers sometimes is, okay, you need to create, you know, if, you're, if you're being, if your society is being undermined by, um, you know, by negative narrative, you know, one of the correct responses should be, well, you need a positive narrative that attracts people. Um, they've been maybe less good at creating that, but. So, so you have a, 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 a good megaphone with a, writing a column a couple times a week for the Post and, and, other, and other outlets. What have you told policymakers <laughs> to think about or what would you like to? We have some in the, you know, in the room that we have an opportunity you can tell. Well, yeah, maybe, raise your maybe, hand. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this is what it might be a good thing to think about. You know, when you have an opportunity to talk to a member of Congress, you know, what, what do you tell them? What, 
what is a, what would be a useful way to think about what to do about this? So first of all, um, it would be useful to have uh, some piece of the US government doing this full time as its only job. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't just be people who do public diplomacy or press communications, which is what it often is now, mm -hmm. um, and who can begin to think full time about the aspects of it, and, and, then, and also beginning to fund research into it, which is happening in a, in a kind of scattered way. Um, and there are foundations doing it, but there should, there should be more. Um, also, I think, um, I think, I think it's, you know, the, the, the lesson of the recent, um, uh, the recent hearings with Mark Zuckerberg is that, you know, Congress really needs to up its game on understanding what this is and how it works. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not They're actually disagreeing that, with you, can yeah, you say? Yeah, <laughs> it's not actually that funny. But, um, you know, we, Gallows humor. You know, the, the le level of knowledge at the high, you know, is incredibly low. Um, I, you know, I would, I would, I mean, this might, this is such an important and urgent and interesting problem with all kinds of facets, both domestic and foreign policy, um, affecting education, affecting research. Um, you know, shouldn't there be a, you know, congressional committee devoted to this? Shouldn't we begin to think harder about which pieces of the U.S. government should be doing this, which pieces of the of the legislature. I mean, I'd like to see there, you know, members of Congress who do this. Is you know, just like we have some who do the Armed Services Committee, and that's what they think about mm -hmm. full time. I'd like someone to be thinking about this all the time. So, because um, there, there may be, there may have to be some regulatory or legislative pieces of the solution. I mean, certainly there will be. The Europeans are going to do that if we don't. So, um, it's time to get on the ball. Well, you know, we appreciate very much your, your being a, a part of addressing that knowledge gap. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here. So that we appreciate that a lot here at the library. So the last thing I want to ask is, uh, you know, you have a good streak on, on winning prizes for your books. <laughs> so not to jinx anything, but, but, but what is your, what's your next project? I thought you were about to say it was my next prize. I, was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I, um, I have, I've, I've been very involved in this issue and in trying to do research on it and also inspire a conversation about it, which is something I hadn't really done before. I've always worked either as a journalist or as a historian, not as a, somebody kind of involved in policy. So it's been new for me. Um, I would very much like to write a book about the year 1989 and what happened afterwards. Um, because we've made a lot of assumptions about what happened then and what happened in the 1990s. And actually, the 1990s were a really interesting decade when you had a huge transformation in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and although it's been written about you know, by journalists at the time and in some scattered ways, I don't think, you know, it's, I think it's, it's one of those things where the 1990s weren't interesting for a long time because it was just kind of old news and stuff that happened that was boring and yesterday. And now suddenly, I think we're at the moment where it's history. And so, oh, now it's a... It's time to it's time to reassess what happened after communism fell. I mean, as you know, most of my my three larger history books have all been about Stalinism, and I think I won't write about Stalin yep. again. <laughs> Done with Stalin. So, so we're having a, a book signing on the most recent book next door at the Woodall Pavilion. So I hope you all will will come join Anne there in a few uh, minutes. But thank you very much. This thank was you. very informative. We Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.